Martin. It is my pleasure to introduce Nathan Levinson, the President of the District Management Council. We are very pleased and thankful that Mr. Levinson is willing to join us today to talk about best practices and lessons learned in improving outcome, outcomes cost effectively for struggling students. Nathan, thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Can people hear me? Is this? Okay, great. Um, it's uh, really my pleasure to be here today. It's kind of like Thanksgiving. I know so many of you. We've been out here so often. Um, it is like coming home. Um, but it's a little better than that, because first of all, I like most of you. And I wish I could say that about my entire family, but that wouldn't entirely be true. And secondly, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day. Um, I've lost count, but my number of days in my life where it's been below 30 degrees have been many, but almost all of them have been out here visiting one of you in this room. Um, and I want to uh, thank Scott and AMSD for bringing us here today. We think we've got a message that's not, not, not just relevant and hopefully practical, but I think really important. You know, the, the question we're going to be talking about is how do you serve your students who struggle? And, and I know every single one of you wake up every single day thinking about that. Because the things you're doing that work really, really well, and you are doing lots of things that work really, really well, um, work for a lot of your kids. And they're not the ones who struggle. By definition, by definition, your kids who are struggling means that all the hard work, all the good ideas, all that you're doing isn't quite yet doing all that we want. But then we layer this other part on it, and it's funny, I always feel a little guilty, a little, but not a lot. Um, we use this word um, cost effectively. And I'll be honest with you, when we started and I was a superintendent and I was even on a school board uh, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't use words like that in public. We certainly didn't say it in mixed company. Um, you know, you didn't mix money with learning. Like one was really good and one was really ugly. Um, we shouldn't be embarrassed, and I hope nobody feels or takes offense this morning, because here's what's happening. The needs of your kids just keep growing. And your resources don't grow nearly as fast. And so if we're going to do all the things we want to do for kids, and there's so much we want to do, we got to find ways to do it within the dollars uh, the feds, the state, and your local community will give you. Do we deserve more? Yeah. Are we going to get more? Maybe a little, probably not a lot. And I suspect in some places, probably not at all. And as you know, and even when you're fortunate enough to, to see a tax increase or growing enrollment, um, the costs just seem to rise as faster, faster. So this is really about, first and foremost, how do you help kids? How do you help the kids that are struggling? And then let's just be practical about it. We've got to do it within the resources we have. Um, originally, I'd asked um, Scott for the six-hour slot today. <laughs> and for reasons I don't understand, he did not give it to me. We're still friends, but so I'm going to have to talk really fast. No. Um, so what we're going to do today is really touch on three things. Uh, first, uh, an overview of the best practices. Uh, second, what's the cost implications? Because like the idea is in the first section, I want to get you excited to say, hey, I want to do this for my kids. We ought to do this for our students. The second section, section says, hey, can we afford it? The good news is you can. And thirdly, we'll, we'll just end very briefly with where you can find some more information. Because as I said, Scott wouldn't give me the six hour block today. Um, just want to put uh, out there the way DMC thinks about the world. And, and what you're going to hear today certainly reflects that thinking. And the thinking, and this was uh, from our very, very first day, we said, first and foremost, the goal is to raise student achievement. It's why you get up in the morning, it's why we get up in the morning. Nothing matters more. That said, that's not sufficient. If that's all we did, that's not victory. We also want to make the work fair and reasonable for your staff 
And lastly, we want to do it within the dollars you have. And when you can do all three of those things at once, that's really exciting. That's the focus of our work, and that's the focus of today's discussion. You will also hear in the breakout sessions um, <clears throat> how real live districts, real people with your real challenges, have been able to implement many of these things. And we just feel very proud that DMC was able to help them along the way. So first point I want to make as we think about the best practices is who these best practices apply to. And this surprises some people. You know, we're often asked to come and talk or help with special education. That's way too narrow. Um, the federal government, in the way they report, the way they fund, has told us if kids have disabilities, they're really different. They certainly have needs. But you know what? If I'm a student uh, with specific learning disability and I'm two years behind in reading, I am first and foremost a student who is two years behind in reading. If I happen to be two years behind in reading and I didn't have a disability, funny thing is, I'm still two years behind in reading. If I happen to be growing up in poverty and I'm two years behind in reading, I still struggle to read. And if I have social and emotional behavioral challenges, which have led me to be a couple of years behind in reading, I'm still struggling to read. And it turns out that most of these best practices apply to all the kids who struggle. And it, we, we, I think we have overfixated because of the federal government and its trickle down effect on first figuring out your label, then figuring out what we're going to do. And one big message this morning is no, figure out what I need, provide it to me, and then figure out how to do that despite all the pressures and kind of weird incentives those labels make us do. Uh, two footnotes. Uh, what we're going to talk about today does not apply to students um, with some severe disabilities. That's a different conference for a different day. And it does not apply to students who are new to the country, speak absolutely no English, or have had very limited education in their home country. But the truth is it does apply to the vast majority of the kids who struggle in your districts. Oops, sorry. We've tried to take a complex topic and simplify it, but hopefully not oversimplify it. Six main ideas here. Uh, one, if you're going to serve students who struggle, first and foremost, core general education instruction has to meet most won't meet all, but has to meet most of these students' needs. Within that, you got to teach these kids to read. Reading is the gateway to all learning. You know that. I know you know that. And so if I have great core instruction, great focus on literacy, that's a great start, but it's not sufficient. You're going to have to do two other things for these struggling kids. You're going to have to give them extra time to learn. Not everybody learns at the same rate. And that extra help during that extra time has to be really targeted. This is like personalized learning without the computer necessarily. No one-to-one -one device required, but if I am struggling in phonics, yes, that extra help should be in phonics. But if I'm struggling in comprehension, that extra help should be in comprehension. I know it's fairly obvious when you think about it, but like way too often we've been in districts saying, Nate, we have really, we like your stuff. We do this extra time and we identify the kids and we bought foundations. Foundations is a phonics program. It's a decent program. There are a lot of others. And all our kids who struggle get foundations. I said, so great. So your kids who struggle in comprehension, you teach them phonics. And there's always a pause. <laughs> and then an awkward pause. And it is the best of intentions, but we really need to know our kids, personalize that extra help to the th topics and skills they need. Uh, point five, and we'll unpack all of these a bit together. Point five is sometimes called the Homer Simpson um, idea. Duh. Um, it says that whoever's going to help struggling kids really ought to be a great teacher who knows the content really, really well. And point six, of course, is you got to measure and monitor how it's working. Because sadly, you can do all of these things, 
But if you don't do them well, if you don't do them well every day in every classroom, you won't get the results you want. And there's a, uh, there's a seventh that I haven't quite figured out how to fit into Monarch's graphic, is that in the background of all of this is the social, emotional, and behavioral supports for kids because I can't do any of this. I can't process or take advantage of these things if my life is um, in chaos and I have to be ready to learn. So we're going to talk a bit about uh, this morning as well is how do you create the social, emotional, behavioral supports that allows this kind of academic support uh, to make such a difference. Uh, first point's just really clear. It's all about general education, folks. If you want to help kids, all kids, you got to make sure that core instruction meets most, not all, but most of the needs of your struggling students. And there are two things that make this hard. One is the belief by some, not all, but by some classroom teachers and principals with the best of intentions, look at a student who struggles, look at a student with special needs and says two things. One, I'm not an expert in how to teach these kids, which may be true. And two, thank God we have an expert down the hall who is specially trained and has special powers and special skills, even has special in their name. We've got a special education department who will solve these kids, fix their problems, make them go to college, and thank God because I don't know how to do that. And they do. And so with the most kind, loving intentions, we do see sometimes really skilled and really caring general education teachers pass the baton and literally send the kids to special education or to Title I instruction. And be clear, even if they stay in the classroom, they're still sometimes sending them to paraprofessionals or sending them to the push-in teacher. That would be so nice if it worked. I think the gen ed teachers would be thrilled, a little easier, special education teachers would be thrilled, but it doesn't work. Uh, what this graph shows, and we could show you a hundred others, that the correlation between how kids with special needs achieve matches and correlates very highly to how students in general education achieve. And that is true for states, it is true for countries, it is true for districts, and it is true for schools. Just can't escape it. Gen ed instruction matters greatly. So does reading. Um, the good news is when it comes to reading, we've cracked the code. Not we, not DMC, not you. But as a country, as a sector, we have. The National Reading Panel 20 years ago, the What Works Clearinghouse 10 or more years ago, uh, real life schools doing this, people have figured out what it takes to get virtually all kids to be able to read and comprehend well. You know, it's things like having very clear expectations, measuring achievement, identifying struggling kids right away, it's providing that extra help. It's providing help from a really strong teacher. Um, it's balanced literacy. There's nothing on this list that I've ever had somebody look at and say, I would not want that to happen in my school. No way are we going to explicitly teach phonics and comprehension. We're never going to give kids 90 minutes of uninterrupted balanced literacy. This is a list that it is almost embarrassing to share because as you know this. You could have written the list. If you're director of curriculum and instruction or an assistant superintendent, I am certain you have sent this email or done this training. We know this. The problem is you have to do it well. The problem is you have to do it every day. And worse yet, you have to do all of it. And that's a challenge. Because as we have looked and studied and worked with many of you, you are doing many of these things, um, but you're not doing all of them every day in every classroom, and there is no partial credit. So you're not getting the, the benefit of these good practices that you already knew. Um, sometimes people will tell us, hey, Nate, I get this list. I agree with it, but we can't afford it. So it's not true. Because you've known how important reading is, you have been investing in it. You just doesn't always show up. You know, I know we've got some school board members here. I spent six years on a school board. 
the line item in your budget that says reading, it's often really small. Like maybe it includes the two reading teachers and some textbooks. But the line item that says elementary classroom teachers, usually pretty big. Well, a third of that should, could be recoded as elementary literacy, because classroom teachers are spending a third of their time. Uh, special educators spend about half their day, instructional day, teaching literacy. Speech therapists, maybe 20%. You're already spending a lot. Um, the good news is that all of these best practices I've shared and kind of raced through, the things that work cost 20 to 25% less than what you're currently doing in most districts. So I want that to settle in for a sec. The things you're doing now cost more than all of those best practices. I do not want to suggest for a second that implementing all of those 10 best practices is easy. If it was easy, you'd already be doing it. There are lots of barriers. We're going to talk about some of them. But the one barrier that will not get in your way is money. That's not the obstacle. Um, but scheduling is. And it's not the only obstacle, but I want to spend a few minutes on this, because this is um, just interesting. We have interviewed, oh, I bet, three or four hundred superintendents through the years, assistant superintendents, another few hundred. And they, always, they spend a lot of time thinking about this list and thinking about instructional practices and thinking about service delivery. And if we're really honest with ourselves, other than the principal, the assistant principal, who is tasked in the spring or in the summer to build a schedule, scheduling is not like on our top 10 most important things to do list in the course of a year. It's a thing we got to get done, but what we have found is that managing time matters every bit as much. And it is a skill, and it is a hard thing to do. Um, but let's just look at, and this goes back to that, like we know what to do, and yet somehow we don't always do it. Um, so here is a schedule of a typical student. 90 minutes of reading, 60 minutes of math, lunch, recess, art, some science and social studies. So it's a first grade student. Here's a student with special needs who struggles to read. And we love this kid, and we care about him, and we're going to help him. And you know, when you, so we're going to give him extra help in reading. But you know, it's not the only struggle we have. A student has speech and language needs as well. So what do we do sometimes? Hey, we give them speech and language during reading. So all of a sudden, the student who is struggling isn't getting 90 minutes of core instruction in literacy, getting 60. So the kid who struggles is getting less core instruction than the student who doesn't. I mean, nobody does this on purpose. Nobody said this is the best way to teach a student to learn to read, give them less instruction. But there are a hundred reasons this happens, and it happens often. And you know, you know we, we, we were good to our word. We are giving them extra help in reading, but the only time we could schedule it was during math. So we are clearly on our path to making our struggling reader struggling in math too. And then we're going to have to pull them out some more for that next year. Um, this happens a lot, unless you're really, really looking for it, managing it. Um, and the reason it happens is because scheduling is hard. So my favorite quotes from those interviews, I'm so excited we hired a new AP, so I don't have to build the schedule anymore. We sometimes assign scheduling to the least senior person. Uh, we don't usually make them take a scheduling test. We usually check for a pulse. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, one is, and it's only preferred, but not required. <laughs> um, scheduling is the bane of my existence, says almost every special educator I've ever met. And yet, every single special educator makes their own schedule in almost every district. And then, you know, this kind of stuff where we do things we know we shouldn't. I know we should do read 180 for 90 minutes, but that'd be impossible to schedule. So we do it for 45. And then we're really surprised that it didn't work, because all those glossy brochures we got, 
said it worked really well elsewhere. But you know, this is a sample district, 5,000 students. We counted over 200 schedules being produced in the elementary schools of a medium-sized district, 200 schedules. And each one influences the other. That's a lot of schedules. That's a lot of interconnection. We very seldom build those 200 schedules as a set, as a system. And if we don't, we end up doing things that we didn't want to do, like 45 minutes of an intervention that takes 90, or pulling kids out of reading to give them reading. Um, so this is one relatively important takeaway is yes, you need to have the right strategies and the right pedagogy and follow those best practices, but you need to implement them in a way in which they're going to be effective. And unfortunately, we have not seen districts able to do that who don't grab the schedule by the horns, infuse expertise, build them as a set, and raise it to a really strategic decision in the same way um, really as important as any other decision you're going to make, and you just can't leave it to each person to do the best they can, because working alone, they will never do the best they could be. Tr equally true at the secondary level. Um, you know, just another schedule of a student who doesn't struggle, kind of a simplified sample schedule. Basically, it can summarize as this. One period a day of everything. Here's a student who struggles. Struggles in math, maybe eighth grade, maybe ninth grade. I know it's early, but do you see the difference? <laughs> Actually, there is a difference. I told you, this is, this, all our efforts are driven by deep care and concern. There is a difference. During math, during that one period of math, we're doing a lot of things differently. Maybe we're co-teaching, maybe we're pushing in, maybe there's a para, maybe we've changed the curriculum, sadly less, not necessarily more, but we're definitely doing stuff. But we're not giving them extra time. We're putting extra adults, perhaps, but definitely not extra time. Here's a model that works a whole lot better. It says, hey, I, st I do struggle, and I definitely need to be in general ed core curriculum. Remember. General ed matters, don't take me away from that. Teach me all of this year's content. But also, give me an extra period. Double up my instructional time. Because you know what? I didn't start struggling if I'm a ninth grader in this double time model. I didn't start struggling September of ninth grade. There's a lot of eighth grade and seventh grade and maybe some sixth grade material I didn't master. So you owe it to me to teach me that stuff. You owe it to me to know what parts of 6th, 7th, and 8th I didn't master. Maybe there's concepts back in 5th grade around fractions that I'm still murky on. And you should pre-teach me. And you're going to reteach me, because even though this first teacher is an awfully good one, I didn't capture and process everything she taught this morning. I just don't learn as quickly as some others. It's really fascinating to me that when districts roll this out, right before they start, the teachers who are teaching this extra period, they're kind of nervous. Like, they don't have a playbook. It's not like a curriculum you get to buy or download. And they're wondering, what are they going to do? Check back with them six or eight weeks later, and they're even more nervous. How am I going to do everything that these students need in just one extra hour a day? There's a lot of things that these kids are going to need to master, a lot of help they're going to need. And even in this model, the teachers teaching it say, I could use twice that. But in this old model, we weren't giving them any of this extra time. And again, we hear time and time again, Nate, I get it, I I'm sold, I like it, but we can't schedule it, and we're going to need a longer day. Yeah, a longer day would be great maybe, uh, but you're not going to get it, so it's not so great. But every district we've seen that's been able to close the achievement gap, that's been able to provide this extra time, has done it without changing the, the length of the day. 
Yeah, that your schedules have to become a tool for implementing best practices, not an obstacle for preventing them. And you know, some of you may know I've spent a bunch of my life um, in the education world, assistant superintendent, a superintendent, worked with 100 or so districts. Prior to that, I spent a lot of time in the private sector. And I'm often asked, what is the biggest difference between the two? And oddly enough, one of the biggest differences is the schedule. Because in my private sector life, a schedule was a piece of paper with lines on it. And if you wanted a new one, it required all of the following, another piece of paper and the same pencil. And you would draw new lines and you'd have a new schedule. Um, that doesn't work that way in K-12. Schedules are like our heart and soul and our identity and like they actually come delivered on a stone tablet, chiseled. And people hang on to them so long, I just have to assume on the other side of that tablet were the Ten Commandments. <laughs> but we decided we had something more important than those, so we flipped it over and put in our schedule. And even if we hate our schedule, we still hang on to them with a near religious fervor. Um, so I don't even want to suggest that changing schedules are easy, um, but I do want to suggest that very few districts have been able to implement these best practices without changing the schedules and without managing the schedules more carefully. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk amongst yourselves. The core question is, um, do schedules control you or do you control the schedules? To what extent um, does your current schedule support these best practices versus make them harder? Talk among yourselves. Okay, I hate to stop such good conversations, but I'm going to. We've got to manage our time. Uh, it was really interesting as I was listening, eavesdropping on all of you. Uh, really, I, I heard and was really encouraging. A, a fair number of you have already made steps to provide extra time during the day or are working on it. So I, I do think that this idea that we need to manage the time we have as a precious resource it is really starting to take root. And I think that is a big change from 10 and 15 years ago. So it's really exciting to see this trend and where we're going. But you know, as hard as it can be to find extra time in the schedule and the political and emotional agita you may go through to get that new schedule, you know, you got to go out and buy the new piece of granite. You got to get your chisel sharpened. You got to start uh, carving away at it. Um, here's, you know, this is a systems thinking approach. Like, there is no silver bullet. And I know I've spent a bit of time talking about time this morning. Time is just a, it's an ingredient. It isn't the whole meal. Because if we've got that extra time, who is in the room for that extra time matters enormously. I mean, I think as they say, it's the teacher, stupid. The teacher matters. Um, and we don't always think about it that way. And again, I know you know that. So I always, again, I feel guilty getting up in front of 100 plus really smart people and telling you the teacher is really important. I mean, you know that. Um, but your actions, we're all friends, right? Your actions don't always suggest that you're doing it. Sometimes you are. But we have as a country said if a student struggles, you know, we're going to provide in many cases what I refer to as a generalist to help. Somebody who may be helping in math and reading and English and science and behavior and they also know the law and they also write IEPs or maybe they're a paraprofessional, so they... Um, we have in many ways institutionalized extra help to come from a generalist, be it a special educator or a paraprofessional, um, or even a general education teacher who's become a reading teacher, doesn't necessarily mean, all those folks in those roles, doesn't necessarily mean that they have a master's in reading. 
that they have years of experience of teaching reading to struggling students. Doesn't mean that they have a track record of significantly getting more than a year's growth every year out of struggling readers. Those are all things we hope for, but it's often not the case. And yet we did say that nothing matters more than the skill and talent and effectiveness of the teacher. What often happens is because the extra helper isn't a deep content strong expert in what they're helping, that extra help tends to be a student reading to a para, a para pointing out words that the student struggled on, that's helping but that's not actually teaching, or uh, the special educator is helping with homework, and when the student asks a question, sometimes we actually see kind of a special educator kind of thumbing back through the book a couple pages to kind of quickly reread that section. Because let's say, so we're asking that special educator to help in algebra and geometry and English, American and European, and social studies. Uh, seven continents and eight eras. We're asking them to do a lot. Interestingly enough, you do not have a general education teacher who would do that without filing a grievance and stopping, stop coming to work. I mean, just try it. Go get your English teacher to go cover Algebra 2 for a year because she happened to have a free period and you happen to need somebody to cover Algebra 2. On the general education side, we take the skill and training of our staff really seriously. Even on the intervention side, you know, sometimes we have seen you know, reading teachers be assigned to be reading teachers because they either wanted to or quite honestly, true story, I don't make this stuff up, principal said, she's not a very good teacher and I wish she'd retire, but I think she's seven years away from retirement, so I wanted to get her out of a classroom, so I made her a reading teacher. That is not a mean person, but it is an implication that anybody could do this job. And for the record, I can read. I cannot be a reading teacher. That is not actually a requisite or sufficient skill. Kids who struggle need the best darn teacher you've got. Let's face it, the kids who struggle already got a period of reading and a period of math from a teacher who is really skilled and trained, and that wasn't enough. That didn't work. And so you got to teach it to me again, and here's the key part. you got to teach it to me differently. You know, this is not the case of if I don't speak English, if you speak louder, I will comprehend more. You can't just reteach the same thing the same way. And so you got to not just know one way of teaching how to find the area of a rhombus. You need three different ways to teach it, because the first two might not be sufficient for some of your struggling kids. This is just a really hard job. It requires a very high skill level. It requires a very high level of training. Um, these teachers, when they're, th these intervention, these extra help teachers, they should be able to look at a wrong answer in math and without asking a question of the child, know where in my thought process, where in the steps I went through, I did something wrong. And worse yet, or better yet, why I made that mistake. That is a really high level of understanding. It is possible, but it is not often happening every day. Um, I want to shift topics a bit, because I, I told you we had that very nice framework, the six things you ought to do to help your kids uh, achieve at high levels, the kids who struggle. But it's a bit of a lie. It's a bit of a lie. Because the kids, that was like all the things we're supposed to do. But the kids have to be ready. They have to be able to concentrate. They need to be able to think school is important and I want to learn. And this is where the social, emotional, and behavioral supports. The, come to play, because if, if we're not meeting the social, emotional, behavioral needs of kids, all those six great best practices probably aren't going to carry the day. And here's the, the message around how do we meet social, emotional, behavioral needs. Um, we're working really hard at this. And we have a lot of people in our schools trying to help. Social workers, guidance counselors, psychologists, behaviors, special education teachers, and obviously the classroom teacher. Um, we've put a lot of people on this. 
So good for us. Maybe not enough. Maybe it's an area of underinvestment. But we've definitely, we're trying. But here's a couple things we want to think about. We need to get all these folks working as a really unified team. They, they need to be integrated. They need to be talking virtually every day. And here's the funny part. I think this, we got one, two, three, four. There's at least five different departments listed here. When we have like the early release days, these people go off often to five different meetings because the social workers often don't report to special ed and the general ed's going off with the principal and guidance is in the guidance department. And um, these really skilled, really talented folks cannot be as successful as we want them to be if they're in five departments that get together a couple times a year, uh, they plan and meet a few times a year. The, we have to find a way to make these folks seamlessly integrated. And the way we're currently structured makes it pretty hard. Again, kind of private sector, changing who reports to whom and who goes to what meetings, it's a lot simpler. There's a lot of cultural and identity politics to this. But there's just one kid we're trying to help. And it is actually going to take six plus roles to help. This, so if the first message is we've got to find a way to bring these people together as a team on a very regular basis. The second point is, look at my chart, a little graphic. I've told you the titles of all the people we need around the table. But here's a little bit dishonest about this. The titles don't tell us enough. So I have met school psychologists that are excellent, highly skilled, uh, highly motivated to help kids who struggle behaviorally. And I've met school psychologists who, if we can get them alone and honest, say, those kids scare me. I have no training in this. When I went to school 22 years ago, this wasn't even on the agenda. This is not my strength. And we've met guidance counselors who are really good providing social and emotional supports. And others, I'd say they're better at scheduling and being the assistant football coach. Um, that's not an insult to any of them. These people have different skills. But way too often, we look at their title and say, because you are an X, we will assign you to do this, that, or the other. So the other big takeaway, we've seen districts that have been really able to meet the social and emotional needs of kids, have not only they brought a team together, but when the team came together and they started assigning who's doing what and roles within the team, they were very honest about the skills and strengths and aptitudes of the people. And we might say, hey, yes, you're all school psychologists, but half of you are going to be integral to our behavior management efforts, and half of you are not, or at least not until you get trained and want to. And that's a, I think that's a cultural shift of acknowledging people in the same department have really different skills, and then actually scheduling, planning, and assigning work based on that. My own experience has been, if you can do this in a judgment-free zone, you as leaders will be more uncomfortable making these distinctions than the folks themselves, because they already know their strengths and their training. Um, but this is definitely a cultural shift, but one that I think is very worthwhile. Um, I want to just talk a bit specifically about managing behavior because we are told, and it is true, damn, this is hard. And it is growing. The needs are growing. We do not know why there are more behavioral challenges, and we do not know why they are starting so much younger, but it doesn't really matter. The kids are coming to school, and we got to help them. And we've often used a strategy of more adults, para to the rescue. We're Nate's got terrible behavioral challenges. Parents, teachers, principals, clamoring, get me a para, and all will be fine. And that's half true. It's actually, it's 24 25ths true. 
There are 25 kids in a classroom and eight has behavior problems. A power professional solves a problem for 24 kids in that room. Not Nate. But because when I have problematic behavior, the power can take me away. Take me out of the hall, take me to a quiet place. And the other 24 kids and the classroom teacher get to continue with their learning. Problem solved for everybody except the student with behavioral challenges. We're helping kids with behavior challenges get through the day. Maybe we string enough days together, we'll help them get through high school and graduate. We are not helping them get through life because that power goes away on graduation day. And the, the research is not very pretty about how well these kids do after they graduate. Um, so we've somehow created a system that's very good for 24 out of 25 kids, definitely helps the 25th get through the day, the week, the year, but it's really not everything we would want if it was your son or daughter. Here's the good news. Having fewer but more highly skilled people is much more helpful. It's a win-win. So imagine you've got this super skilled behaviorists who's working with some power professionals. The powers aren't going away, but they are trained and skilled in managing behavior, and they actually volunteered to work with kids with behavior. They actually want to be doing this work, and they float between classrooms on an unfixed schedule, checking in with kids as they go throughout the day, and checking back in with their behaviorist supervisor every single day or even twice during the day. Um, and we're going to have this focus on prevention. Um, I would shared that list of um, reading best practices, what works clearinghouse. We all like it. Um, interestingly enough, they almost went out of business, almost got shut down. And that was not a political statement about the role of federal government. It was because they couldn't certify hardly anything is working. They did hundreds and hundreds of these reviews and nothing seemed to pass muster. Ultimately, they found some things they could certify as it works. And elementary reading was one of the first. But behavior management was right up there with it. I think at one point when they had about 10 things on their website, behavior and early literacy was pretty much it. There are things that really work well here. And what's so exciting about them is they are very preventative in nature. What we're teaching kids is warning signs before there's an outburst. They can see it coming. And before there's an outburst, they're taught coping mechanisms, things they can do to prevent it. Most significantly, uh, teachers are actually the number one cause of outbursts. I'm not trying to pass the blame. But it is true that there are triggers. And it, you know, there's a great quick story of a student when he was asked a question that he doesn't know the answer to, feels vulnerable, feels embarrassed, um, happened to be my son, who the way he dealt with embarrassment was to punch the kid next to him. Um, not a particularly productive way, but in the moment, it seemed much better than all of his alternatives. Um, and so we, we've seen teachers learn that, hey, if Nate is a student or where if I put him on the spot, put him on the spot, that is likely to trigger an outburst. They created this little system. If the pencil's going this way, you can ask me a question. If it's going the other way, don't. And obviously then they started working on a target of you know, a couple questions a week and building from there. This is a focus on preventing the problematic behavior from happening. Um, it really does work. It takes time. It takes a team of people. It's not just the classroom teacher who can do this, hence the need. But this is a really exciting field of helping kids being able to stay in the classroom, helping kids learning how to cope, building the skills that are going to help them be successful, not just in school, but in those 80 years after school called life. Um, and it's fewer adults, but much higher skilled. The last thing we want to talk about, if you're going to help kids with social and emotional behavioral needs, because there are a lot of these kids and they need a lot of help, we just have to be very proactive in managing the time 
of that team. We have done hundreds of, we have this tool, it's called schedule sharing. I know some of you in this room have used it in your district. Where we asked a staff to basically share what they did for a week. Um, and it turns out, if you look at social workers, these super skilled, can't possibly have enough of them. We have so many needs, they could be busy morning, noon, and night. Well, they're busy in the morning, but noon and night, they're in meetings and doing paperwork. On average in America, a social worker in a public school spends about 40% of their week with students. We've been in many school districts where these super skilled, in-demand folks spend less than 20%, one day out of five, actually with kids. Not because they like it. Very few people decided to get a master's in social work because of their intense love of meetings. But we do put them in meetings in some districts four out of five days and in most districts three out of five. But if they were working in private practice, or if they were working for that nonprofit that you like so much that does counseling to families downtown, they're expected to be with kids and actually helping 80 to 85 percent of the week. So these, our resources are so valuable and so scarce for social and emotional behavioral. We really need to declare war on meetings, streamline the paperwork, yes, stay in compliance, but let them help kids more of the week than they are in many, many districts. So I'm hoping there's at least one or two best practices I've shared where the inner monologue is, yeah, that'd be nice to do. I'd do it if I could in my district. And then you, people often get home and they start to think about this and they say, you know, it's the right stuff to do, but we don't have the money. So I just want to talk a little bit about how do you pay for this stuff. And the short answer is, nothing I've shared with you today costs more than your spending. Um, that best practice reading effort, all 10 of those best practices from the What Works Clearinghouse and National Reading Panel cost about $2,100 a student. Are the most common interventions we see, kind of special education, resource room, that costs almost $4,000 a student. Reading Recovery, a great program, which has fanatical followers, costs about $6,000 a student. At the secondary level, that extra time model, double time for math or English, $1,000 a student. Some districts are spending five or more thousand dollars a student on co-teaching. Two, two takeaways from this slide. One, that these best practices are actually less expensive than many common practices. Second takeaway, I just told you how much each of those interventions costs. I hate to ruin your morning, but now or in the near future, you're going to sit down and build a budget. You do it every year. It stinks every year. Um, you have mounds of papers and charts and data. I'm just curious, how often do you have this information in front of you as you're building your budget? You ought to. Part of managing serving struggling kids cost effectively is to know the cost of how you're serving struggling kids. When we've shared this, and I just remember principal who was absolutely enamored with co-teaching and demanding two more teachers in their building. Why? Because they were not meeting all the needs of their kids. So we are just, we are leaving kids behind because what we do de facto is we ration services. Like we say, this is how many teachers we've got, and this is how many co-teaching periods we have, and some kids get co-teaching, some don't. I'm just using co-teaching as an example. Could be reading recovery. Um, we just have so many slots. Um, that's not right. But here's the interesting part. Shifting to these best practices, you don't shift because you get to save all this money. You shift because you can then help a lot more kids. These better practices allow you to dramatically expand the services and the number of kids you're helping. Um, the service delivery model 
matters from a pedagogical point of view. Some work better than others. That's why John Hattie got to write a book and check them all out for us. But they also, these different service delivery models have really different staffing requirements. This is a classic example of a, wanting to help 100 kids. And if you said, hey, we're going to do push-in to help 100 kids, on average, that takes about 10 teachers. And if we're going to do pull-out, four. Um, and if we're going to do double time, less than two. I mean, there's variation, but they, these are pretty typical numbers we see. So not only does the different service delivery models change how you're helping kids, they dramatically impact um, what you spend. And to be clear, it is a good thing to spend more if it works better. We should not be driving to the lowest cost solution. But we should take some comfort in knowing that many of these best practices also happen to be lower cost solutions. That's the win-win, and there are not many of them in our world. We really, as a group, can't figure out or can't decide how many teachers does it take to serve kids who struggle. This is data from 1,400 school districts. Essentially, we asked, how many special educators do you have? How many paraprofessionals do you have? And we asked a whole bunch of questions about your demographics and your spending and your size. And what basically this says is some of you have three times as many special education teachers as others, taking into account the size of your district. And some of you have four times as many special, uh, special ed power professionals as others. Now, if you're thinking, well, yeah, some people have more teachers, but they have fewer paras and vice versa. Very reasonable thought, but completely wrong. Uh, what we have found from the data, and again, this is data that covers districts that teach one out of every three kids in America. So it's a pretty big sample. Um, it says that if you've got more teachers, you also had more paras. It also said that if you controlled for the number of kids with IEPs, the distribution stayed the same. So if you're thinking, hey, we identify more kids, that's why. Nope. Within a group of districts that have a similar identification rate, you still see this spread. Hey, but you know, some districts are just wealthier. They have more money to spend. What we controlled for per pupil spending didn't change the outcome. Oh, we controlled for the types of kids you're educating, higher needs kids, high poverty schools, didn't change. Turns out, no matter how you slice and dice and group the districts, you know, I mean, literally, we have been in places where you can take two districts that are six miles apart, and they are virtually identical in every way, shape, and form, identification rate, spending, kids they serve, and one of them will have three times as many staff as the other. And one of the most interesting parts is each believed everybody else had the same. Each believed that they were understaffed, of course. Each believed that having just a few more teachers would have made a world of difference. Um, at its core, we, we lack um, a, a precise way of thinking about and managing that really big question of how much staff do we need, and hopefully those best practices I shared earlier should put us even on a much bigger discussion of what is the skill, training, and background. We have focused too much on the number of people, quantity over skill and training. Um, you know, if you want to manage your folks, or, um, you know, wh whichever types of people you have, and no matter how many staff you have, we really got to think about how much time they spend with kids uh, nationwide. I think at last count, there were 600,000 special educators in America. More than half of their time goes to meetings and paperwork. So we got the equivalent of like 320,000 FTE in America doing meetings and paperwork. There just has to be a better use for talented people's time. And it's not their fault. I mean, we are all in charge. So if you're wondering who to blame, um, well, I won't answer that. Um, and also, you know, we never let math teachers figure out how many kids should be in their math class. Pretty rare does the Algebra 1 teacher say, you know, Miss Principal, Miss Principal, 
I'll take 15 this year, first period, but I only want nine last period. But honestly, you all as board members and district leaders wrestle with that question. And some of you will say 25 kids in Algebra 1 is right, and 29 in, in another district, and 33 because you must in another district. But the question of how many kids are in front of a teacher is a super high-level, oft-debated, important decision you make. Oh, except if it's a special education teacher, a speech therapist, a reading teacher, we often leave that question up to them. And they're going to do what they think is right. They're going to do what they can schedule. But again, too important to not, particularly since the research is pretty clear on this. A group of five kids, say for reading intervention, if the five of us have the same needs, putting five of us together is not a bad thing, even six. Contrast that to a group of three kids, one struggling in phonics, one in fluency, and one in comprehension. They're in a group of three. Three must be better than five, isn't it? It's a smaller group. Oh, but for that 30 minutes, only 10 minutes of it's going to be on comprehension, because I also got to do some phonics for the students struggling in phonics. So three might not be better than five. And what do those three have in common? Like, why do we do something like that? Well, they have something really important in common. Mrs. Smith is their homeroom teacher, and that was the easiest way to group them. That's why we put three kids with different needs together, because that's how we could build a schedule. Um, you know, we, we are just constantly looking for and asking for, and rightfully so, more staff. Just want to give a real quick example of reading teachers, tier two intervention reading teachers, whose people are worth their weight in gold. Um, but you know, how many groups do they teach in a day? How many students do they help? This is very common. We will go into a district and see, hey, on average, five groups a day, four kids in a group, nothing extreme, nothing embarrassing. You look at that and say, yeah, seems reasonable. But every time we've brought principals, teachers themselves, superintendents and central office around a table and said, this is what you do. How do you feel about it? And you know, they kind of think five groups a day is pretty reasonable. But these are only half an hour groups. So that's two and a half hours of instruction. Math teachers are doing five periods, almost double. Classroom teachers are doing two and a half times this much instruction. And we did say these are really valuable people working on one of those most fundamental skills. When people sit around the table and just think this through, they are much more likely to end up somewhere like this, especially if they're going to group kids with similar needs. That's not a crazy, horrific, impossible schedule for a reading teacher. It also serves exactly twice as many students with the staff you have. That's a pretty powerful increase without adding a single person. Um, uh, we're going to skip. It just says, hey, it matters a lot. The kinds of, eh, I'm running a little over. We're all end on time, don't worry. Um, the kinds of guidelines you need for how to use time are really precise. Remember, I, I told you that we have guidelines for like how many kids should be in a math class at the high school? Grab a postage stamp, flip it over, and you could write 25 or 28. That's your guideline for staffing Algebra 1. Pretty simple. These kind of guidelines I'm talking about for use of time and group size, vastly more complicated. They do not fit on a postage stamp. You will actually need two or three pages because a kindergartner is going to be different than a fifth grader. And kids who need articulation versus language, kids who um, need phonics versus fluency, kids, these are much more complicated guidelines. That may be why we don't have them. But they are worth spending two, three days in the summer with your staff to really think these through. Because without them, 50% of their time goes to meeting and paperwork, and maybe only half as many kids are being helped. Pretty powerful return for a few days of planning. 
Uh, lastly, I want to just touch on English language learners. It's that other group that is just growing in, in need and moving into more and more districts. Um, the good news is, again, not for the kids brand new to the United States and not for kids who did not go to school in their home country. There's a lot of similarities um, with what works with some added nuances. So it's what we've shared plus, but it's not entirely different. It's what we've shared already plus. For example, you know, all kids need to learn vocabulary. That's part of balanced literacy. But English language learner students really need extra time on academic vocabulary, the words that they're going to hear in classroom. What's a beaker? If you're reading about the Revolutionary War, what's a red coat? Words that are very specific to their instruction. Um, we're going to teach comprehension to all of our kids. But we really need to provide background knowledge to students for them to be able to comprehend. And, and so on. So I don't want to suggest that what you do is exactly the same for students with English language learning. Um, but there's a lot of overlap, plus a little. Here's the dilemma, though. And this one I don't have a great answer for you. But I can tell you what a bad answer is. There is so much pressure, because these kids have so many needs, to say, hey, it'd be so much easier on our staff if we took the native speakers, put them here, take the English language learners, put them there. Um, the teachers don't have special in their name, but they do have English language learner in their title. Um, and there is a huge pressure to kind of separate again labels and differences. And it would be a lot easier for your staff. But it hasn't worked. You really need to have mixed classes and mixed interventions. And to do that, you're going to need to support your teachers substantially because not every classroom teacher has that skill set. And this is my one disappointing slide, because I think everything else I've shared with you, hey, it's good for the budget, it's good for staff, it really works. This works, but this is hard. And we have a lot of teachers who are not ready to be able to do this, but it is a direction you're going to need to go, because the separating them isn't going to get you there. Um, so lessons learned. Learned the hard way by DMC, with the help of many in this room. Start by knowing how time's currently used. You really got to know what you're doing today before you can move on to where you want to go tomorrow. Um, you're going to need scheduling expertise one way or another, or you're not going to be able to implement this work. Um, this change process is hard as can be. You need lots of communication, frequent communication, partnership with parents, with staff, with principals. Uh, you're going to be a lot of talking. That is a core ingredient of being able to implement this. Good communication. And this is not a special education effort. They can't do it alone. It is a group effort. Um, but as a group, you can definitely make this happen. Um, um, as I said, I needed about five more hours. I'm not going to get them. I've got about a minute. So more resources, spending money wisely. Our, the District Management Journal uh, cover story on improving special education, this issue. Um, my book, Better Way to Budget, helps you get people through the change process. All of these available at the DMC website. And just lastly, if anybody wants to talk more, I'll be here today. Uh, contact information is at the end of the slides as well. As you may have gathered, I love to talk about this stuff, so please reach out. And also, um, Superintendent's Conference in January, talking about innovation, why it works and why it doesn't. Be great to have some of you there as well. Um, with that, I thank you very much and appreciate all you do and hope that you've left here with at least one idea that you'll take back home and give it a try. Thanks.